Well, we are currently looking at events between the Old and New Testaments in that 400-year range between uh, Malachi and Matthew. And we've focused quite a bit of our attention on the great crisis of the second century BC, when Antiochus IV fulfilled prophecy from the book of Daniel by setting up the abomination of desolation, and how Judas Maccabee also fulfilled bits of the Daniel prophecy by taking down that abomination of desolation and rededicating the temple and establishing uh, the Jewish holiday Hanukkah. And uh, we have most recently talked about how the, the ending of that abomination of desolation and the death of Antiochus IV looked like it was going to end the war, but it didn't. And so even after December of 164 and January of 163, a lot of the Greeks decided they still wanted to annihilate the Jewish faith and any Jew that believed in it. And so Judas Maccabee continued the fight for the next several years. But in 160, he was tired, clearly, of all the fighting and felt that he was maybe going to lose the war completely if he didn't do something. So he reached out to the Romans and made a mutual assistance treaty with them. This is the very first official contact between the Roman and Jewish peoples. And it happened in 160. Uh, And uh, it will become very important in future relations between those two peoples. And I'll emphasize it repeatedly uh, as we continue this study between uh, the Testaments. But this is the sad thing that I have to report. Judas was killed in battle shortly after he reached out to the Romans to make that agreement. In fact, I am not altogether certain he ever saw the bronze tablets that made this thing official that were issued by the Roman Senate. Because we are told uh, that he was involved in a battle where he was severely outnumbered. I mean, it was already bad before the battle began, uh, so much so that we were told that his 3,000 hand-picked men shrunk down to only about 800. The rest of them ran away because they were so worried about this upcoming battle. So I want to read to you from 1 Maccabees chapter 9, starting at verse number 7. It says, When Judas saw that his army had slipped away and the battle was imminent, He was crushed in spirit, for he had no time to assemble them. He became faint, but he said to those who were left, Let us get up and go against our enemies. We may have the strength to fight them. Now, it is interesting to me, having read a lot of his pre-battle speeches uh, before this, there's a big difference here. He doesn't mention God. In other places, he always mentioned God, but he doesn't seem to do it here. He seems to be just saying, we got to get out here and fight for ourselves. Verse number nine, but they, the 800 that are left, tried to dissuade him saying, we don't have the strength. Let us rather save our own lives now and let us come back with our kindred and fight them. We're too few. So they actually told Judas, listen, we need to run away. We need to retreat. We got to get out of here, do a strategic withdrawal because we don't have enough. Uh, Let's go back and, and regroup our forces and then take these guys on. But listen to what Judas says back. Judas said, far be it from us to do such a thing as to flee from them. If our time has come, let us die bravely for our kindred and leave no cause to question our honor. So again, you'll notice, no mention of God here. 
And this frustrates me so, so very much that a man who is, has fought so eminently on behalf of God, always mentioning God, has suddenly now come to his final battle and there's no mention of God. Uh, so the next part of the story is that the army of Bacchides uh, marched out from their camp and took its stand for the encounter. The cavalry was divided into two companies. The slingers, the archers were ahead of the army, as did all the chief warriors. Bacchides was on the right wing, flanked by the two companies. The phalanx advanced at the sound of the trumpets, and the men with Judas also blew their trumpets and the earth was shaken by the noise of the armies, and the battle raged from morning until evening. Judas saw the Bacchides, and the strength of his army were on the right, and then all the stout-headed men went with him, and they crushed the right wing, and he pursued them as far as Mount Azotus. And when those on the left wing saw that the right wing was crushed, they turned and followed close behind Judas and his men. So it's really wild here. Judas and his guys actually attacked the strongest side of their opponent's army. Because I guess he figured if I can break their strong point, then maybe the rest will collapse and run away. And it might have worked, except the left side of uh, of Bacchides' army decides that they're going to wrap around behind Judas and his men and catch them in a pincher movement. Verse 17, the battle became desperate and many on both sides were wounded and fell. Judas also fell. So he dies in this battle and then the rest fled. Uh, so everybody runs away of the 800 that survived this engagement. And uh, then we're told that Jonathan and Simon took their, bo- their brother Judas and buried him in the tomb of their ancestors at Modain and wept for him. All Israel made great lamentation for him. They mourned many days and said, How is the mighty fallen the Savior of Israel. Now, the rest of the acts of Judas and his wars and the brave deeds that he did and his greatness have not been recorded, but they were very many. So, uh, not everything that he did has been recorded, but an awful lot of it has. And you can see it in First and Second Maccabees, as well as in the writings of Josephus in the Antiquities of the Jews, which is where I want to go to next. Antiquities, uh, book number 12, and uh, we're in chapter number 11 of that book, uh, subsection 1, and uh, I, I want you to hear Josephus' account of this same end of Judas and <clears throat> some of the, um, of the accolades that he makes uh, at the death of this man. Uh, this is, uh, the, the, the el- extra subsection is four, two, three. It says, Judas had no more soldiers than 1,000. We know that he had about 800. Uh, when these saw the multitude of Bacchides' men, they were afraid and left their camp and fled all away, excepting 800. Now, when Judas was deserted by his own soldiers and the enemy pressed upon him, and gave him no time to gather his army together. He was disposed to fight with Bacchides' army, though he had but 800 men with him. So he exhorted these men to undergo the danger courageously and encouraged them to attack the enemy. And when they uh, said that they were not bodily sufficient to fight uh, so great an army and advised that they should retire now and save themselves and that when he had gathered his own men together, Uh, Then he fell upon the enemy afterward. His answer was this, let not the son ever see such a thing that I should show my back to the enemy. And although this be the time that I, that bring me to my end and I must die in this battle, I will rather stand to it courageously and bear whatsoever comes upon me than by now running away, bringing reproach upon my former great actions or tarnish their glory. So you can see here, 
he seems to think that this is going to speak negatively about him if he runs away. And I disagree. I think he, he would have done so much better if he'd uh, retreated at this point, but he didn't. This was the speech that he made to those that remained with him and whereby he encouraged them to attack the enemy. Uh, Bacchides drew his army out of his camp, put them in array for battle. He set the horsemen on both the wings, the light soldiers and the archers he placed before the whole army, but was himself on the right wing. And when he had thus put his army in battle, uh, was going to join the battle with the enemy, he commanded the trumpeters to give a signal of battle, and the army was made to shout and to fall on the enemy. And when Judas had done the same, he joined the battle with them, and as both sides fought valiantly, the battle continued till sunset. Judas saw that Bacchides and the strongest part of the army was in the right wing, and thereupon took the most courageous men with him, ran upon that part of the army, fell upon those that were there, and broke their ranks, drove them into the middle, forced them to run away, and pursued them as far as the mountain called Azah. But when those of the left wing saw that the right wing was put to flight, they encompassed Judas, pursued him, came behind him, took him in the middle of their army, so that not being able to fly, but he and those that were with him fought. And when they had slain a great many of those who came against him, he at last was himself wounded and fell and gave up the ghost and died in a way like to his former famous actions. When Judas was dead, those who were with him had no one whom they could regard as their commander, but when they saw themselves deprived of such a general, uh, they fled. But Simon and Jonathan, Judas's brethren, received his dead body by a treaty from the enemy and carried it to the village Modin, where their father had been buried, and there buried him, while the multitude lamented him many days and performed the usual solemn rites of funeral for him. And uh, this was the end of Judas that he came to. He had been a man of valor and a great warrior, and mindful of all the commands of his father, Mattathias. And it had uh, undergone all difficulties, both in doing and suffering, for the liberty of his countrymen. And when his character was so excellent while he was alive, he left behind him a glorious reputation and memorial by gaining freedom for his nation and delivering them from slavery under the Macedonians. And when he had retained the high priesthood three years, he died. And so that is Josephus's tribute to Judas Maccabee, who died in 160 BC, having uh, fought valiantly for uh, several years, many years, against uh, not just uh, the Gentiles that were trying to annihilate the faith, but also against many renegade Jews uh, that wanted to just throw off uh, the covenant uh, of the Jewish people with their God, the one who was, is, and will always be. So now that they had no official general, uh, they had to turn to one of the brothers. And Judas's brother, Jonathan, is the one they decided to turn to. Now, it is interesting that it mentions here uh, in Josephus's writings that Judas functioned as high priest for three years. Uh, and we know that Jonathan, his brother, will function as priest, and so will uh, Simon, uh, his brother, uh, later function as high priest. Now, the official high priest, whenever this war started, uh, had been appointed by the Macedonian Greeks, and they had actually appointed uh, another guy to be priest uh, over the Jewish people whenever uh, that guy, uh, the original guy, uh, ends up uh, being removed. And so there's actually a Macedonian Jewish high priest uh, in direct uh, opposition to the high priest Judas Maccabee, who cleansed the temple and reestablished all of the sacrifices, and then his brothers. Uh, and uh, this, this begins to cause trouble 
uh, amongst the Jewish people. And here's, here's my explanation and my tie-in to the New Testament. A couple of things I want to explain here. First of all, the group that we know in the New Testament as the Pharisees got their start at this time of Judas Maccabee and actually his dad, uh, Mattathias, uh, the Hasmonean. Uh, because there was a group around at that time called the Hasidim, uh, so the righteous ones. Uh, and Pharisee is the idea of being separated. So the Pharisees got started at this time because they were all on board with this idea that the Jewish people did need to be separated from the Gentiles in their faith and in their actions, and that this was the right thing to do. And so the Pharisees were the protectors of the law. They were the protectors of the priesthood. They were the protectors of the temple and its sacrifices. And so Judas was very much one of the initial Pharisees, uh, one of the heroes of, of protecting everything that is Jewish. But... Judas, nor his brothers, nor his nephews that came later, were from the high priest line uh, from the time of Solomon, uh, the uh, line that is called the line of Zadok. Uh, that was supposed to be the official high priest line. Now, the Macedonians apparently had tried to put somebody from that line in place because they were trying to play games, I think. Uh, but uh, the Jewish people, at least some of them, were not happy that Judas and his brothers and his nephews were not from the line of Zadok, and yet they were functioning as high priests. It was, a, it was a very technical point of disagreement, but it was a legitimate point of disagreement. Um, in reality, Judas and his brothers and his nephews should not have been functioning as high priests. They should have supported a legitimate, properly righteous high priest from the line of Zadok, but they didn't. They took it themselves. And so we have another group that gets started in opposition to the Pharisees of this time, and they go by the name of Zadokim, that is, the supporters of the Zadok priest. We know that name in its Greek form, Sadducee. Sadducee. Uh, so this is the beginning point for the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. And so I just want you to be aware of that and that it actually was um, a reaction uh, to the high priesthood of uh, Judas and his brothers and his nephews uh, that was just mentioned here. Let's go ahead and speed up our study at this point and uh, just summarize some of the things taking place from here forward. After Judas's death in 160, his brother Jonathan becomes the new high priest and leader of the Jewish people. And something intriguing happens at this point. As I mentioned, uh, the Greeks are kind of fighting amongst themselves around this time. They're debating and arguing as to which relative of uh, Antiochus III, that'd be Antiochus the Great, should be in charge of this throne. Because you remember, Antiochus IV usurped the throne from his nephew. Uh, well, that nephew has grown up, and he's causing trouble, and he's got a cousin that's causing him trouble back, and we've got other relatives that are involved in the whole thing. And so what happens, weirdly, is that the Greeks start reaching out to the Jews and asking them to take a side in their fight. And basically, uh, we've got Greek leaders saying to the high priest Jonathan, hey, if you pick my side and support me, I will definitely guarantee that you 
and uh, your people will be protected in your religion, and you'll be high priest, you'll be our friend, you'll be the leader of your people. And so this happens several different times where there's like a shift between which side of the Greek civil war in Syria uh, the Jewish people end up supporting. Until finally, one side ends up killing Jonathan. And that happens in 143 BC. And in his place comes his brother, Simon. And uh, that is important because when Simon is in power in 142 BC and declared to be uh, the official high priest by uh, Demetrius II, who's kind of the Greek leader that seems to be winning at that point, um, Demetrius effectively declares that Judea is now an independent kingdom and that it's basically in an alliance relationship with Greek Syria. And from that time, uh, the Jewish people start counting the Hasmonean kingdom. And uh, this is what we have written in 1 Maccabees 14, verse 41 and 42. In the 170th year, the yoke of the Gentiles was removed from Israel, and the people began to write in their documents and contracts, quote, In the first year of Simon, the great high priest and commander and leader of the Jews. So this is now a new phase in Jewish history. We have an independent Jewish state starting in 142 BC. Uh, now the, the next year, uh, actually two years later, in 140, the Jewish people... Uh, in the sixth month of that year, the 18th day of that month, the Jewish people honor Simon for all that he's been doing by declaring him to be their ethnarch. Now, ethnarch is a Greek word. Uh, eth has to do with ethnicity. It's the people group that you belong to. And ark has to do with rulership. So an ethnarch is the ruler over an ethnic group of people. Uh, it's not quite king, but it's getting there. And uh, let me read their declaration to you uh, as it appears in 1 Maccabees chapter 14, starting at verse 41. The Jews and their priests have resolved that Simon should be their leader and high priest forever until a trustworthy prophet should arise and that he should be a governor over them and that he should take charge of the sanctuary and appoint officials over its tasks and over the country and the weapons and the strongholds and that he should take charge of the, uh, uh, excuse me, and that he should be clothed in purple and wear gold. Um, nope. I skipped a line, that he should take charge of the sanctuary, that he should be obeyed by all, and that all contracts in the country should be written in his name, and that he should be clothed in purple and wear gold. Actually sounds like he's king, doesn't it? Continuing, none of the people or priests should be permitted to nullify any of these decisions or to oppose what he says or to convene an assembly in the country without his permissions or to be clothed in purple or to put on a gold buckle. That definitely sounds like he's king. Whoever acts contrary to these decisions or rejects any of them shall be liable to punishment. All the people agree to grant Simon the right to act in accordance with these decisions. So Simon accepted and agreed to be high priest, to be commander and ethnarch of the Jews and the priests, and to be protector of them all. And they gave orders to inscribe this decree on bronze tablets to put them in a conspicuous place in the precincts of the sanctuary and to deposit copies of them in the treasury so that Simon and his sons may have them. Uh, now, uh, all of that sort of activity at the end there, that sounds very much like the Romans, which is not surprising because Jonathan has re-upped when he was high priest of the Jews that alliance with the Roman peoples. 
which was then re-encoded on bronze tablets. Then, when Simon comes to power, guess what he does? He reaches out to the Romans, and he reinstates again this mutual assistance pact between the Roman Senate and the Jewish people. And so, everything is starting to look like the Jewish People are turning into a kingdom underneath a priest king, and they are having this ongoing alliance with the Roman Senate and the Roman people. And so this is really setting the stage for what is coming yet in the future. So have a great weekend. Come back on Monday, and we will continue this transition study.